Why did Schoenberg face sharp criticism in his day? The Vienna-born American composer Arnold Schoenberg, 1874-1951 now considered one of the great masters of the 20th century. Was derided for having thrown out the rules of composition for working outside the confines of traditional harmony. In his youth, he was a fan of Wagner's compositions, seeing each of his major operas repeatedly. A series of Schoenberg's early works reflect the Wagnerian influence. But just after the turn of the century, Schoenberg set out on his own path. The result was the 1909 composition Three Pieces for Piano, which some music historians argue is the single most important composition of the 20th century. The work is atonal, which is to say it is organized without reference to key. Schoenberg abandoned the techniques of musical expression. As they had been understood for hundreds of years. This was no small moment for the music world, and many reacted with vocal and vehement criticism. Of the outcry Schoenberg remarked in 1947 that it was as if I had fallen into an ocean of boiling water. But he had his followers, too, among them his students. Though he was essentially self taught as a composer, he became one of the most influential teachers of his time. It's interesting to note, however, that his teaching approach was grounded in the traditional practices of tonal harmony. He later brought order to the chaos of atonalism by developing a 12-tone serialism. Showing how entire compositions could be organized around an ordained sequence of 12 notes. However, he never taught the method and rarely lectured or wrote about it. Why did Schoenberg face sharp criticism in his day? The Vienna-born American composer Arnold Schoenberg, 1874-1951 Now considered one of the great masters of the 20th century was derided for having thrown out the rules of composition for working outside the confines of traditional harmony. In his youth, he was a fan of Wagner's compositions, seeing each of his major operas repeatedly. A series of Schoenberg's early works reflect the Wagnerian influence. But just after the turn of the century, Schoenberg set out on his own path. The result was the 1909 composition Three Pieces for Piano, which some music historians argue is the single most important composition of the 20th century. The work is atonal, which is to say it is organized without reference to key. Schoenberg abandoned the techniques of musical expression as they had been understood for hundreds of years. This was no small moment for the music world, and many reacted with vocal and vehement criticism. Of the outcry Schoenberg remarked in 1947 that it was as if I had fallen into an ocean of boiling water. But he had his followers, too, among them his students. Though he was essentially self taught as a composer, he became one of the most influential teachers of his time. 
It's interesting to note, however, that his teaching approach was grounded in the traditional practices of tonal harmony. He later brought order to the chaos of atonalism by developing a 12-tone serialism. Showing how entire compositions could be organized around an ordained sequence of 12 notes. However, he never taught the method and rarely lectured or wrote about it. Why does the music of Bartok figure prominently in concert programs today? Bela Bartok, 1881-1945, is revered today not only for his ability as a pianist. His teacher compared him to Franz Liszt 1811-1886, who was perhaps the greatest pianist of the 19th century. But for his compositions, which are steeped in the tradition of Hungarian folk music. Bartok studied and analyzed Hungarian, Romanian, and Arabian folk tunes. Publishing thousands of collections of them in his lifetime. While ethnic music had influenced the works of other composers, Bartok was the first to make it an integral part of art music composition. His works were unique in that the folk music provided the sheer essence and substance of the music, lending the compositions a primitive quality. Among his masterpieces are his three stage works the ballets The Wooden Prince and The Miraculous Mandarin, and the one-act opera Duke Bluebeard's Castle. The introduction of folk music as the core of a musical composition has had far-reaching influence, which must have been felt by American composer Aaron Copland, 1900-1990. Nineteen forty four features a simple shaker tune, front and center. Why does the music of Bartok figure prominently in concert programs today? Bella Bartok. 1881-1945, is revered today not only for his ability as a pianist. His teacher compared him to Franz Liszt 1811-1886, who was perhaps the greatest pianist of the 19th century. But for his compositions, which are steeped in the tradition of Hungarian folk music, Bartok studied and analyzed Hungarian, Romanian, and Arabian folk tunes. Publishing thousands of collections of them in his lifetime. While ethnic music had influenced the works of other composers. Bartok was the first to make it an integral part of art music composition. His works were unique in that the folk music provided the sheer essence and substance of the music, lending the compositions a primitive quality. Among his masterpieces are his three stage works, the ballets The Wooden Prince and The Miraculous Mandarin, and the one-act opera Duke Bluebeard's Castle. The introduction of folk music as the core of a musical composition has had far-reaching influence, which must have been felt by American composer Aaron Copland, 1900-1990, whose Appalachian Spring, 1944, features a simple shaker tune, front and center. 
Is Stravinsky the 20th century's foremost composer? The Russian-born American composer Igor Stravinsky, 1882-1971. Is certainly one of the greatest composers of the 20th century. Stravinsky wrote concerts, chamber music, piano pieces, and operas, as well as ballets, for which he may be most well known. Between 1903 and 1906, Stravinsky studied under the great. Russian composer Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, 1844-1908 In 1908 Stravinsky wrote his first work of note, the orchestral fantasy fireworks, which was in honor of the marriage of Rimsky-Korsakov's daughter. The piece caught the attention of Sergei Diaghilev, 1872-1929, of the ballet's Russes who invited the young composer to participate in the ballet company's 1910 season. Ballet's Russes had dazzled audiences the year before, bringing new energy to the art form. In collaboration with Dyagulev, Stravinsky went on to create masterpieces The Firebird. 1910, Petrushka, 1911, and Rite of Spring, 1913, among them. The partnership served to elevate the role of the ballet composer in the art world. Rite of Spring is either Stravinsky's most famous or most infamous work. It was first performed by the ballet's Russes in the third week of its 1913 season. The choreography was arranged by the famous dancer Václav Nijinsky, 1890-1950. But the performance stunned both the music and dance worlds. So extreme was the audience's reaction to this premiere. Work that a riot nearly broke out inside the theater. Stravinsky had composed his music not to express Spring's idyllic qualities but rather its turmoil and dissonance similar to childbirth. Nijinsky paired Stravinsky's composition with complicated and visually frenzied dance movements. Later characterized by the composer as a jumping competition. Though many thought it a disastrous performance, when the ballet's Russes continued to London. Rite of Spring was more widely accepted there largely because the audience had been duly prepared for it. The following year, Rite of Spring was performed in concert in Russia, but the reaction was mixed. The young composer Sergei Prokofiev, 1891-1953, was in the audience and later wrote that he had been so moved by the work that he could not recover from the effects. Listeners today are still moved by the elevated rhythm of Rite of Spring, which makes an entire orchestra into a kind of sustained percussion instrument. Ultimately, most musicians and critics came to regard the watershed work as one of the finest compositions of the 20th century. Is Stravinsky the 20th century's foremost composer? The Russian-born American composer Igor Stravinsky, 1882-1971 is certainly one of the greatest composers of the 20th century. Stravinsky wrote concerts, chamber music, 
piano pieces, and operas, as well as ballets, for which he may be most well known. Between 1903 and 1906 Stravinsky studied under the great Russian composer Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, 1844-1908 In 1908 Stravinsky wrote his first work of note, the orchestral fantasy fireworks, which was in honor of the marriage of Rimsky-Korsakov's daughter. The piece caught the attention of Sergei Dyagulov, 1872-1929, of the ballet's Russes who invited the young composer to participate in the ballet company's 1910 season. Ballet's Russes had dazzled audiences the year before, bringing new energy to the art form. In collaboration with Dyagulov, Stravinsky went on to create masterpieces The Firebird. 1910, Petrushka, 1911, and Rite of Spring, 1913, among them. The partnership served to elevate the role of the ballet composer in the art world. Rite of Spring is either Stravinsky's most famous or most infamous work. It was first performed by the ballet's Russes in the third week of its 1913 season. The choreography was arranged by the famous dancer Vaslav Nijinsky, 1890-1950. But the performance stunned both the music and dance worlds. So extreme was the audience's reaction to this premiere. Work that a riot nearly broke out inside the theater. Stravinsky had composed his music not to express Spring's idyllic qualities but rather its turmoil and dissonance similar to childbirth. Nijinsky paired Stravinsky's composition with complicated and visually frenzied dance movements. Later characterized by the composer as a jumping competition. Though many thought it a disastrous performance, when the ballet's Russes continued to London. Rite of Spring was more widely accepted there largely because the audience had been duly prepared for it. The following year, Rite of Spring was performed in concert in Russia, but the reaction was mixed. The young composer Sergei Prokofiev, 1891-1953, was in the audience and later wrote that he had been so moved by the work that he could not recover from the effects. Listeners today are still moved by the elevated rhythm of Rite of Spring, which makes an entire orchestra into a kind of sustained percussion instrument. Ultimately, most musicians and critics came to regard the watershed work as one of the finest compositions of the 20th century. Who invented jazz? Ferdinand Jelly Roll Morton, 1885-1941 a New Orleans pianist, claimed credit for having invented jazz. And to some degree, it was fair of him to think so after all, his recordings with the group The Red Hot Peppers. 1926-30, are among the earliest examples of disciplined jazz ensemble work. But in truth, the evolution of jazz from ragtime and blues was something that many musicians in several cities, took part in. Most regard Morton as one of the founders of jazz, the other founders include Benny Moten. 
1894-1935, U.B. Blake, 1883-1983, Duke Ellington, 1899-1974, and Thomas Fats Waller, 1904-1943. Some would go back even farther to trace the roots of jazz, from 1899 to 1914 Scott Joplin. 1868 to 1917, popularized ragtime, which was based on African folk music. Even astute music critics may not be able to draw a clear-cut distinction between ragtime and early jazz. Both musical forms rely on syncopation, the stressing of the weak beats. And either style can be applied to an existing melody and transform it. The definitions and boundaries of the two terms have always been subject to debate. Which is further complicated by the fact that some musicians of the time considered ragtime to be more or less a synonym for early jazz. But there are important, albeit not strict, differences between the two genres as well. Rags were composed and written down in the European style of notation, while early jazz was learned by ear. Players would simply show one another how a song went by playing it. Jazz encourages and expects improvisation, whereas ragtime, for the most part, did not. And the basic rhythms are also markedly different, with jazz having a swing or hot rhythm that ragtime does not. Whatever its origins, jazz became part of the musical mainstream by the 1930s and influenced other musical genres as well including classical. American composer George Gershwin, 1898-1937 was both a songwriter and composer of rags as well as a composer of symphonic works. Many of his works, including Rhapsody in Blue, 1924, and his piano preludes contain ragtime and jazz elements. Perhaps more than any other composer and musician, Miles Davis. 1926 to 1991, expanded the genre through decades of prolific work. Davis constantly pushed the boundaries of what defines jazz and in so doing set standards for other musicians. Who invented jazz? Ferdinand Jelly Roll Morton 1885 to 1941, a New Orleans pianist, claimed credit for having invented jazz. And to some degree, it was fair of him to think so after all, his recordings with the group The Red Hot Peppers. 1926 to 30, are among the earliest examples of disciplined jazz ensemble work. But in truth, the evolution of jazz from ragtime and blues was something that many musicians in several cities took part in. Most regard Morton as one of the founders of jazz, the other founders include Benny Moten. 1894 to 1935, Eubie Blake, 1883 to 1983, Duke Ellington. 1899-1974, and Thomas Fats Waller, 1904-1943. Some would go back even farther to trace the roots of jazz, from 1899-1914 Scott Joplin. 1868-1917, popularized ragtime, which was based on African folk music. <laughs> 
even astute music critics may not be able to draw a clear-cut distinction between ragtime and early jazz. Both musical forms rely on syncopation, the stressing of the weak beats. And either style can be applied to an existing melody and transform it. The definitions and boundaries of the two terms have always been subject to debate. Which is further complicated by the fact that some musicians of the time considered ragtime to be more or less a synonym for early jazz. But there are important, albeit not strict, differences between the two genres as well. Rags were composed and written down in the European style of notation, while early jazz was learned by ear. Players would simply show one another how a song went by playing it. Jazz encourages and expects improvisation, whereas ragtime, for the most part, did not. And the basic rhythms are also markedly different, with jazz having a swing or hot rhythm that ragtime does not. Whatever its origins, jazz became part of the musical mainstream by the 1930s and influenced other musical genres as well including classical. American composer George Gershwin, 1898-1937 was both a songwriter and composer of rags as well as a composer of symphonic works. Many of his works, including Rhapsody in Blue, 1924, and his piano preludes contain ragtime and jazz elements. Perhaps more than any other composer and musician, Miles Davis. 1926 to 1991, expanded the genre through decades of prolific work. Davis constantly pushed the boundaries of what defines jazz and in so doing set standards for other musicians. Is blues music older than jazz? Only slightly and only if your definition of jazz doesn't include ragtime. Really, the two musical traditions developed side by side. With blues emerging about the first decade of the 1900s and hitting the height of its early popularity in 1920s Harlem. Where the songs were seen as an expression of African American life. Great blues singers like Ma Rainey, 1886 to 1939, and Bessie Smith, 1894 or 1898 to 1937, sang of the black reality determined but weary. During the Harlem Renaissance, the music was a symbol for African American people who were struggling to be accepted for who they were. Poet Langston Hughes, 1902-1967, saw the blues as a distinctly black musical genre. And as helping to free blacks from American standardization. As the first person to codify and publish blues songs. American musician and composer W.C. Handy, 1873-1958, is considered the father of the blues. The Florence, Alabama, native produced a number of well-known works, including Memphis Blues, St. Louis Blues, which is one of the most frequently recorded songs in popular music. Bale Street Blues, and Careless Love. <laughs> 
Is blues music older than jazz? Only slightly, and only if your definition of jazz doesn't include ragtime. Really, the two musical traditions develop side by side. With blues emerging about the first decade of the 1900s and hitting the height of its early popularity in 1920s Harlem. Where the songs were seen as an expression of African American life. Great blues singers like Ma Rainey, 1886-1939, and Bessie Smith. 1894 or 1898 to 1937, sang of the black reality determined but weary. During the Harlem Renaissance the music was a symbol for African. American people who were struggling to be accepted for who they were. Poet Langston Hughes, 1902 to 1967, saw the blues as a distinctly black musical genre and as helping to free blacks from American standardization. As the first person to codify and publish blues songs, American musician and composer W.C. Handy, 1873-1958, is considered the father of the blues. The Florence, Alabama, native produced a number of well-known works, including Memphis Blues, St. Louis Blues, which is one of the most frequently recorded songs in popular music. Bale Street Blues, and Careless Love. When did the big band era begin? On December 1, 1934, Benny Goodman's Let's Dance was broadcast on network radio. Which effectively launched the swing era, in which big band music achieved huge popularity. Goodman 1909 to 1986 was a virtuoso clarinetist and band leader. His jazz-influenced dance band took the lead in making swing the most popular style of the time. When did the big band era begin? On December 1, 1934, Benny Goodman's Let's Dance was broadcast on network radio. Which effectively launched the swing era, in which big band music achieved huge popularity. Goodman, 1909-1986, was a virtuoso clarinetist and band leader. His jazz-influenced dance band took the lead in making swing the most popular style of the time. How old is country music? Old-time music or hillbilly music both early names for country music. Emerged in the early decades of the 1900s. By 1920 the first country music radio stations had opened. And healthy record sales in rural areas caused music industry executives to take notice. But it was an event in 1925, in the middle of the American Jazz Age. That put country music on the map, on November 28, 1925.
WSM Radio broadcast the WSM Barn Dance, which soon became known as the Grand Ole Opry when the Master of Ceremonies, George D. Hay, took to introducing the program that way since it was aired immediately after an opera program. The show's first performer was Uncle Jimmy Thompson, 1848-1931. Early favorites included Uncle Dave Macon, 1870-1952, who played the banjo and sang. And Roy Acuff, 1903-1992, who was the Opry's first singing star. Millions tuned in and soon the Nashville-based show had turned Tennessee's capital city into music. City USA In the 1960s and again in the late 1980s and 1990s, country music reached the height of popularity. While holding on to its small town, rural-based audience who were the show's first fans. How old is country music? Old time music or hillbilly music, both early names for country music. Emerged in the early decades of the 1900s. By 1920 the first country music radio stations had opened. And healthy record sales in rural areas caused music industry executives to take notice. But it was an event in 1925, in the middle of the American Jazz Age. That put country music on the map, on November 28, WSM Radio broadcast the WSM Barn Dance which soon became known as the Grand Ole Opry when the Master of Ceremonies, George D. Hay, took to introducing the program that way since it was aired immediately after an opera program. The show's first performer was Uncle Jimmy Thompson, 1848-1931. Early favorites included Uncle Dave Macon, 1870 to 1952, who played the banjo and sang. And Roy Acuff, 1903 to 1992, who was the Opry's first singing star. Millions tuned in and soon the Nashville-based show had turned Tennessee's capital city into music. City USA in the 1960s and again in the late 1980s and 1990s, country music reached the height of popularity. While holding on to its small town, rural-based audience who were the show's first fans. Is bluegrass music a distinctly American genre? Yes, the style of music developed out of country music during the late 1930s and throughout the 1940s. Bill Monroe, 1911-1996, a country and bluegrass singer-songwriter, altered the tempo, key, pitch, and instrumentation of traditional country music to create a new style named for the band that originated it. Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys, Monroe's home state was Kentucky. Bluegrass was first heard by a white audience when in October 1939. Monroe and his band appeared on the popular country music radio program The Grand Ole Opry. Although Bluegrass evolved through several stages and involved a host of contributors, through it all Bill Monroe remained the guiding and inspirational force. 
and therefore merits the distinction of being the father of bluegrass. Is bluegrass music a distinctly American genre? Yes, the style of music developed out of country music during the late 1930s and throughout the 1940s. Bill Monroe, 1911-1996, a country and bluegrass singer-songwriter, altered the tempo, key, pitch, and instrumentation of traditional country music to create a new style named for the band that originated it. Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys, Monroe's home state was Kentucky. Bluegrass was first heard by a white audience when in October 1939. Monroe and his band appeared on the popular country music radio program The Grand Ole Opry. Although bluegrass evolved through several stages and involved a host of contributors, through it all Bill Monroe remained the guiding and inspirational force. And therefore merits the distinction of being the father of bluegrass. Who was more important to rock and roll Elvis Presley or the Beatles? while music historians and fans of either or both may be willing to offer an opinion. The question cannot be definitively answered. The fact is that popular music today would not be what it is had it not been for both Elvis Presley and the Beatles. And the influences of both are still felt. Elvis Presley, 1935-1977, brought to music an exciting and fresh combination of country, gospel, blues, and rhythm and blues music, and topped it all off with a style and sense of showmanship that dazzled young audiences. His first commercial recording was That's All Right, Mama in 1954 which was followed in 1956 by the success of Heartbreak Hotel. Between 1956 and 1969 he had 17 number one records. Presley defined a new musical style and an era. Among those the American Presley had influenced were four English musicians who called themselves the Beatles. Originally founded as the Quarrymen by John Lennon, 1940-1980, in 1956. The group became the most popular rock and roll band of the 1960s. Their first single was Love Me Do, released on October 5, 1962, and producer George. Martin was encouraged that the Beatles could produce a number one record. In 1963 they did. Please Please Me was released in Britain on January 12th and was an immediate hit. Other hits off their first album included She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand. The follow-up album, With the Beatles was released in 1964 and established them as Britain's favorite group. Already popular in their homeland, Beatlemania began in the United States on February 7, 1964, when the Mop Top Fab Four, Lennon along with Paul McCartney, B. 1942, George Harrison, 1943 to 2001 and Ringo Starr B 1964
1940, arrived at New York's Kennedy International Airport and were met by a mob of more than 10. 000 screaming fans and 110 police officers. Two days later, on February 9, the Beatles made their legendary appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. By April the group held onto the top five positions on the U.S. singles charts. The British invasion had begun. In their early years, the Beatles brought a new energy to rock. And roll and picked up where Presley, Buddy Holly, and Little Richard had left off. The instrumentation and orchestration of Beatles songs, for which their producer George Martin deserves at least some of the credit, were innovative at the time, and are common for rock music today. Their rock movies, A Hard Day's Night, 1964, and Help, 1965, were a precursor to the music videos of today. When the band decided to break up, the April 10, 1970, announcement proved to be the end of an era. Who was more important to rock and roll Elvis Presley or the Beatles? While music historians and fans of either or both may be willing to offer an opinion, the question cannot be definitively answered. The fact is that popular music today would not be what it is had it not been for both Elvis Presley and the Beatles. And the influences of both are still felt. Elvis Presley, 1935-1977, brought to music an exciting and fresh combination of country. Gospel, blues, and rhythm and blues music and topped it all off with a style and sense of showmanship that dazzled young audiences. His first commercial recording was That's All Right, Mama in 1954, which was followed in 1956 by the success of Heartbreak Hotel. Between 1956 and 1969 he had 17 number one records. Presley defined a new musical style and an era. Among those the American Presley had influenced were four English musicians who called themselves the Beatles. Originally founded as the Quarrymen by John Lennon, 1940-1980, in 1956. The group became the most popular rock and roll band of the 1960s. Their first single was Love Me Do, released on October 5, 1962, and producer George. Martin was encouraged that the Beatles could produce a number one record. In 1963 they did. Please Please Me was released in Britain on January 12th and was an immediate hit. Other hits off their first album included She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand. The follow-up album, with the Beatles, was released in 1964 and established them as Britain's favorite group. Already popular in their homeland, Beatlemania began in the United States on February 7, 1964, when the mop top Fab Four, Lennon along with Paul McCartney, B. 1942, George Harrison, 1943 to 2001, and Ringo Starr, B. 1940, 
arrived at New York's Kennedy International Airport and were met by a mob of more than 10. 000 screaming fans and 110 police officers. Two days later, on February 9, the Beatles made their legendary appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. By April the group held onto the top five positions on the U.S. singles charts. The British invasion had begun. In their early years, the Beatles brought a new energy to rock. And roll and picked up where Presley, Buddy Holly, and Little Richard had left off. The instrumentation and orchestration of Beatles songs, for which their producer George Martin deserves at least some of the credit, were innovative at the time, and are common for rock music today. Their rock movies, A Hard Day's Night, 1964, and Help, 1965, were a precursor to the music videos of today. When the band decided to break up, the April 10, 1970, announcement proved to be the end of an era. Why is the ballet's Russes famous? The notoriety of the ballet's Russes began on a May night in 1909. It was then that the company, created by Russian impresario Sergei Dyaghilev, 1872-1929, performed innovative ballet choreographed by Michel Fokin, 1880-1942. The Parisian audience, made up of the city's elite, was wowed by the choreography, set design, and musical scores as well as the performances of the lead dancers the athletic vigor of Vaslav Nijinsky. The delicate beauty of Tamara Karsavina, the expressiveness of Anna Pavlova, and the exotic quality of Ida Rubinstein. Ballet had been freed of the constraints and conventions that had held it captive. The art form was reawakened. The reforms were on every level, choreography, performance, costuming, and design. The company's chief set designer was Leon Baxt, 1866-1924, whose sense of color had influenced not only stage designs but even women's fashions. Soon Dyaghilev and the ballet's Russes were at the center of the art world. Major 20th century painters, including Robert Edmund Jones, Pablo Picasso, Andre de Rain, Henry Matisse, and Joan Miro, created set and costume designs for the dance company. And Diaghilev commissioned music that could match the spectacular dancing, choreography, and decor of his ballets. History's most celebrated composers, including Maurice Ravel, Claude Debussy, Richard Strauss, Sergei Prokofiev, and Igor Stravinsky, provided the scores for the dances performed by Ballet's Russes. The company, under Diaghilev's direction, had created a completely different kind of dance drama. Bringing ballet out of the shadows of opera and asserting it as an art form unto itself. The ballet companies of today are the lasting legacy of the ballet's Russes. Diaghilev illustrated that through a collaborative process. Excellent art could be created outside the traditional academy. The ballet's Russes provided 20th century dance with the
model of the touring ballet company and seasonal repertory. Why is the ballet's Russes famous? The notoriety of the ballet's Russes began on a May night in 1909. It was then that the company, created by Russian impresario Sergei Dyagulov, 1872-1929, Performed innovative ballet choreographed by Michel Fokin, 1880-1942. The Parisian audience, made up of the city's elite, was wowed by the choreography, set design, and musical scores. As well as the performances of the lead dancers the athletic vigor of Vaslav Nijinsky. The delicate beauty of Tamara Karsavina, the expressiveness of Anna Pavlova, and the exotic quality of Ida Rubinstein. Ballet had been freed of the constraints and conventions that had held it captive. The art form was reawakened. The reforms were on every level, choreography, performance, costuming, and design. The company's chief set designer was Leon Baxt, 1866-1924, whose sense of color had influenced not only stage designs but even women's fashions. Soon Dyagulov and the ballet's Russes were at the center of the art world. Major 20th century painters, including Robert Edmund Jones, Pablo Picasso, André de Rain, Henry Matisse, and Joan Miro, created set and costume designs for the dance company. And Diogulov commissioned music that could match the spectacular dancing, choreography, and decor of his ballets. History's most celebrated composers, including Maurice Ravel, Claude Debussy, Richard Strauss, Sergei Prokofiev, and Igor Stravinsky, provided the scores for the dances performed by ballet's Russes. The company, under Diogulov's direction, had created a completely different kind of dance drama. Bringing ballet out of the shadows of opera and asserting it as an art form unto itself. The ballet companies of today are the lasting legacy of the ballet's Russes. Diogulov illustrated that through a collaborative process. Excellent art could be created outside the traditional academy. The ballet's Russes provided 20th century dance with the model of the touring ballet company and seasonal repertory. Who was Balanchine? The name of the Russian-born choreographer is synonymous with modern American ballet. George Balanchine, 1904-1983, was one of the most influential choreographers of the 20th century. Creating more than 200 ballets in his lifetime and choreographing 19 Broadway musicals as well as four Hollywood films. He co-founded three of the country's foremost dance institutions. The School of American Ballet, in 1934, the American Ballet Company, 1935, and the New York City Ballet, 1948, the first American ballet company to become a public institution. His entrance into the world of dance was entirely accidental, in August 1914 Balanchine accompanied. <laughs> 
his sister to an audition at the Imperial School of Ballet and was invited to audition as well. Though his sister failed, he passed and, against his own wishes, was promptly enrolled. However, Balanchine remained uninterested in the art form. Even running away from school shortly after starting. The turning point for the young dancer came with a performance of Tchaikovsky's ballet The Sleeping Beauty, 1890. He was dazzled by the experience and chose to stay with the school's rigorous training program. Serenade, 1935, music by Tchaikovsky, is considered by many to be Balanchine's signature work. His other well-known works include Apollo, 1928, The Prodigal Son, 1929, The Nutcracker, 1954, and Don Quixote, 1965, as well as Jules, the first full-length ballet without a plot. Remembering the opportunity he had been given as a child. Balanchine was known for choreographing children's roles into many of his ballets. His outreach did not end there, he organized lecture demonstration tours for schools. Gave free ballet performances for underprivileged children, conducted free annual seminars for dance teachers. And gave free advice and use of his ballets to other ballet companies. Balanchine's unparalleled body of work was instrumental in establishing the vibrant style and content of contemporary ballet in America. Where he brought ballet to the forefront of the performing arts. Who was Balanchine? The name of the Russian-born choreographer is synonymous with modern American ballet. George Balanchine, 1904-1983, was one of the most influential choreographers of the 20th century. Creating more than 200 ballets in his lifetime and choreographing 19 Broadway musicals as well as four Hollywood films. He co-founded three of the country's foremost dance institutions. The School of American Ballet, in 1934, The American Ballet Company, 1935, and the New York City Ballet, 1948, the first American ballet company to become a public institution. His entrance into the world of dance was entirely accidental, in August 1914 Balanchine accompanied his sister to an audition at the Imperial School of Ballet and was invited to audition as well. Though his sister failed, he passed and, against his own wishes, was promptly enrolled. However, Balanchine remained uninterested in the art form. Even running away from school shortly after starting. The turning point for the young dancer came with a performance of Tchaikovsky's ballet The Sleeping Beauty, 1890. He was dazzled by the experience and chose to stay with the school's rigorous training program. Serenade, 1935, music by Tchaikovsky, is considered by many to be Balanchine's signature work. His other well-known works include Apollo, 1928, The Prodigal Son, 1929, The Nutcracker, 1954, and Don Quixote, 1965, as well as Jules, 
the first full-length ballet without a plot. Remembering the opportunity he had been given as a child. Balanchine was known for choreographing children's roles into many of his ballets. His outreach did not end there, he organized lecture demonstration tours for schools. Gave free ballet performances for underprivileged children, conducted free annual seminars for dance teachers. And gave free advice and use of his ballets to other ballet companies. Balanchine's unparalleled body of work was instrumental in establishing the vibrant style and content of contemporary ballet in America. Where he brought ballet to the forefront of the performing arts. Why is Beowulf considered an important work? Beowulf, the earliest manuscript of which dates to about a d1000, is the oldest surviving epic poem in English or any other European vernacular. It was written in Old English, the language of the Anglo-Saxons in England, used CAD 500-1100. Its author is unknown. Categorized as a folk epic, Beowulf tells the story of a Scandinavian warrior hero who on behalf of the Danish king, fights and kills the fearsome monster Grendel. Then slays the monster's mother, and finally engages a fire-breathing dragon in mortal combat. Because of its combination of Christian and pagan themes. Scholars believe the epic may have been written as early as 700 or 750. How old are Aesop's fables? They date back to the 6th century B. C. However, it was not until the late 1600s that English language versions appeared. In 1692 a complete translation of the stories, which are believed to have been written by a Greek slave, were published in London by Sir Roger Ellis Strange, 1616-1704. The short, moralistic tales, which were handed down through the oral tradition, include the well known story of the tortoise and the hare, which teaches the lesson slow and steady wins the race, and the one about a wolf in sheep's clothing people are not always what they seem. Since some of the timeless fables have been traced to earlier literature, Many believe it is almost certain that Aesop is a legendary figure. Why did Schoenberg face sharp criticism in his day? The Vienna-born American composer Arnold Schoenberg 1874 to 1951 Now considered one of the great masters of the 20th century was derided for having thrown out the rules of composition for working outside the confines of traditional harmony In his youth he was a fan of Wagner's compositions seeing each of his major operas repeatedly a series of Schoenberg's early works reflect the Wagnerian influence. But just after the turn of the century, Schoenberg set out on his own path. 
the result was the 1909 composition Three Pieces for Piano. Which some music historians argue is the single most important composition of the 20th century. The work is atonal, which is to say it is organized without reference to key. Schoenberg abandoned the techniques of musical expression. As they had been understood for hundreds of years. This was no small moment for the music world and many reacted with vocal and vehement criticism. Of the outcry Schoenberg remarked in 1947 that it was as if I had fallen into an ocean of boiling water. But he had his followers, too, among them his students. Though he was essentially self-taught as a composer, he became one of the most influential teachers of his time. It's interesting to note, however, that his teaching approach was grounded in the traditional practices of tonal harmony. He later brought order to the chaos of atonalism by developing a 12-tone serialism. Showing how entire compositions could be organized around an ordained sequence of 12 notes. However, he never taught the method and rarely lectured or wrote about it. Why is the Iliad studied today? Greek poet Homer's, c. 850 BC. Iliad and Odyssey, both works credited to him, are considered to be among the greatest works of literature and have had a profound influence on Western poetry, serving as the primary models for subsequent works, including the Aeneid, Virgil, and the Divine Comedy. Dante. The Iliad in particular can be seen as both the beginning of Western literature as we know it, and the culmination of a long tradition of oral epic poetry that may date as far back as the 13th century BC. The Iliad has been a part of Western education for nearly 3,000 years. The epic poem, telling the story of a ten-year Trojan War. Reveals the author's keen understanding of human nature. Who invented jazz? Ferdinand Jelly Roll Morton, 1885-1941, a New Orleans pianist, claimed credit for having invented jazz. And to some degree, it was fair of him to think so after all, his recordings with the group The Red Hot Peppers. 1926-30, are among the earliest examples of disciplined jazz ensemble work. But in truth, the evolution of jazz from ragtime and blues was something that many musicians in several cities took part in. Most regard Morton as one of the founders of jazz, the other founders include Benny Moten. 1894 to 1935, Ubi Blake, 1883 to 1983, Duke Ellington. 1899 to 1974 and Thomas Fats Waller 1904 to 1943 Some would go back even farther to trace the roots of jazz from 1899 to 1914 Scott Joplin 1868 to 1917 popularized ragtime which was based on African folk music 1900s 
even astute music critics may not be able to draw a clear-cut distinction between ragtime and early jazz. Both musical forms rely on syncopation, the stressing of the weak beats. And either style can be applied to an existing melody and transform it. The definitions and boundaries of the two terms have always been subject to debate. Which is further complicated by the fact that some musicians of the time considered ragtime to be more or less a synonym for early jazz. But there are important, albeit not strict, differences between the two genres as well. Rags were composed and written down in the European style of notation, while early jazz was learned by ear. Players would simply show one another how a song went by playing it. Jazz encourages and expects improvisation, whereas ragtime, for the most part, did not. And the basic rhythms are also markedly different, with jazz having a swing or hot rhythm that ragtime does not. Whatever its origins, jazz became part of the musical mainstream by the 1930s and influenced other musical genres as well including classical. American composer George Gershwin, 1898-1937 was both a songwriter and composer of rags as well as a composer of symphonic works. Many of his works, including Rhapsody in Blue, 1924, and his piano preludes, contain ragtime and jazz elements. Perhaps more than any other composer and musician, Miles Davis. 1926 to 1991, expanded the genre, through decades of prolific work. Davis constantly pushed the boundaries of what defines jazz and in so doing set standards for other musicians. How old is the dramatic form of tragedy? Tragedy, a form of drama central to Western literature, dates to ancient times the 5th century B. C, when Greeks held a religious festival to honor the god Dionysus. God of fertility, wine, and, later, drama. Famous ancient tragedies include Oresteia by Aeschylus, who is credited with inventing tragedy. Oedipus Rex by Sophocles and Medea and Trojan Women by Euripides. The philosopher Aristotle observed that tragedy's function is a cathartic one by participating in the drama. The spectators are purged of their emotions of pity and fear. The well-known Renaissance tragedies of William Shakespeare, 1564-1616, hearken back to the works of Roman statesman and playwright Seneca, C4b.ca.d65, who wrote during the first century. He is credited with creating dramatic conventions including unity of time and place. Violence, bombastic language, revenge, and ghostly appearances. Why is Shakespeare widely studied? English dramatist Ben Jonson 1572-1637, said it best when he proclaimed that Shakespeare was not of an age, but for all time. Most teachers and students, 1572-1637, 
not to mention critics and theatergoers down through the ages. Likely agree with Johnson's remark, Shakespeare's canon, consisting of 37 plays, divided into comedies. Tragedies, or histories, plus poems and sonnets, expresses universal and unchanging human concerns as no other works have. Shakespeare's words are familiar even to those who have not studied them. Not simply because of the many contemporary adaptations of his works. But because Shakespearean phrases and variations thereof have, through the years, fallen into common usage. Consider these few examples from Hamlet alone, neither a borrower nor a lender be. To thine own self be true, and the play's the thing. No other writer's plays have been produced so often or read so widely in so many countries. What is known about Homer? It is most likely that Homer was an oral poet and performer. Though little is known about Homer, it's believed that he was an Ionian Greek who lived circa the 8th or 9th century BC. In the 1920s scholar Milman Perry proved that Homer's poems were formulaic in nature. Relying on generic epithets, such as Wine Dark Sea and Rosy Fingered Dawn. Repetition of stock lines and descriptions and themes typical of oral folk poetry. All of this suggested that Homer was most likely a bard or rhapsodon. Itinerant professional reciter who improvised pieces to be sung at Greek festivals. Why is Spain's Alhambra historically important? The elaborate palace, built east of the city of Granada, in southern Spain, was built by Moors, Muslim North Africans who occupied the Iberian Peninsula. Spain and Portugal, for hundreds of years during the Middle Ages, 500-1350. The fortified structure, built between 1238 and 1354, is a monument of Islamic architecture in the Western world. Its name is derived from an Arabic word meaning red, the highly ornamental palace. With its decorative columns, walls, and ceilings, was constructed of red brick. Perched on a hilltop, the Alhambra was the last stronghold of the Moors in Spain. In 1492 the palace was captured by forces of Spain's King Ferdinand. 1452-1516, and Queen Isabella, 1451-1504. Who was Dante's Beatrice? In Dante's masterpiece The Divine Comedy, the central figure is led to redemption by a character named Beatrice. His earlier guide through hell and purgatory was the great Roman poet Virgil. Dante Alighieri 1265 to 1321 was born in Florence, Italy, where he also spent much of his life. In 1274, at the age of 9, he was introduced to Beatrice Portinari. They met again 9 years later. <laughs> 
and Dante was profoundly affected by her beauty and grace. When she died in 1290, Dante was inspired to commemorate her in several works. Most notably the Divine Comedy, c. 1308-1321. Beatrice is also depicted in Dante's The New Life, c. 1293, a collection of 31 love poems. He wrote The Banquet, c. 1304-1307, another collection of lyrical poems, to commemorate Beatrice's death. When did modern architecture begin? The term modern architecture is used to refer to the architecture that turned away from past historical designs in favor of designs that are expressive of their own time. As such, it had its beginnings in the late 19th century when architects began reacting to the eclecticism that was prevalent at the time. Two schools emerged, Art Nouveau and the Chicago School. Art Nouveau, which had begun about 1890, held sway in Europe for some 20 years and was evident not only in architecture and interiors, but in furniture, jewelry, typography, sculpture, painting, and other fine and applied arts. Its proponents included Belgian architects Victor Horta, 1861-1947, and Henry van de Velde, 1863-1957, and Spaniard Antonio Gaudi, 1852-1926. But it was the Chicago School that, in the rebuilding days after the Great Chicago Fire, 1871, created an entirely new form. American engineer and architect William L. E. Baron Jenny, 1832-1907, led the way. Four of the five younger architects who followed him had at one time worked in Jenny's office. Louis Henry Sullivan, 1856-1924, Martin Roche, 1855-1927, William Hollibird, 1854-1923, and Daniel Hudson Burnham, 1846 to 1912. Burnham was joined by another architect, John Wellborn Root, 1850 to 1891. Together these men established solid principles for the design of modern buildings and skyscrapers where form followed function. Ornament was used sparingly, and the architects fully utilized iron, steel, and glass. By the 1920s modern architecture had taken firm hold, and in the mid-20th century it was furthered by the works of Walter Adolf Gropius, 1883-1969, L. E. Corbusier, Charles Edouard Ginaret, 1887-1965, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, 1886-1969, and Frank Lloyd Wright, 1867-1959. For practical purposes. Modern architecture ended in the 1960s with the deaths of the aforementioned masters. Examples of modern architecture include Chicago's Monadnock Building, 1891, Reliance Building, 1895, Carson Perry Scott Store, 1904, and Roby House, 1909, 
New York City's Rockefeller Center, 1940. Lever House, 1952, and C. Graham Building, 1958, as well as Taliesin West, 1938-59, in Arizona. Johnson Wax Company's Research Tower, 1949, in Wisconsin, and the Laval House, 1929, in Los Angeles. What innovations are credited to Virgil? Scholars acclaim Virgil, 70 to 19 b. c. for transforming the Greek literary traditions, which had long provided Roman writers with material, themes, and styles. Virgil populated his pastoral settings, always idealized by other writers. With contemporary figures, he combined observation with inquiry. Employed a more complex syntax than had been in use previously, and developed realistic characters. These technical innovations informed all subsequent literature. However, writing was not supposed to have been Virgil's occupation, in his youth. He studied rhetoric and philosophy, and he planned to practice law, but proved too shy for public speaking. So he returned to the small family farm his mother and father operated, where he studied and wrote poetry. In addition to the Aeneid, Virgil wrote Eclogues, or Bucolica, a set of ten pastoral poems written from 42 to 37 BC, as a response to the confiscation of his family's lands. And Georgics, a four-volume work, written from 36 to 29 BC, glorifying the Italian countryside. Within 50 years of his death in 19 BC, Virgil's poems became part of the standard curriculum in Roman schools, ensuring the production of numerous copies. Virgil's works have remained accessible to scholars and students ever since. How old is country music? Old Time Music or Hillbilly Music, both early names for country music. Emerged in the early decades of the 1900s. By 1920 the first country music radio stations had opened. And healthy record sales in rural areas caused music industry executives to take notice. But it was an event in 1925, in the middle of the American Jazz Age, that put country music on the map. On November 28, WSM Radio broadcast the WSM Barn Dance, which soon became known as the Grand Ole Opry when the master of ceremonies, George D. Hey took to introducing the program that way since it was aired immediately after an opera program. The show's first performer was Uncle Jimmy Thompson, 1848-1931. Early favorites included Uncle Dave Macon, 1870-1952, who played the banjo and sang. And Roy Acuff, 1903 to 1992, who was the Opry's first singing star. Millions tuned in and soon the Nashville-based show had turned Tennessee's capital city into music. City USA. <laughs> 
In the 1960s and again in the late 1980s and 1990s, country music reached the height of popularity. While holding on to its small town, rural based audience who were the show's first fans. How old is the Great Wall of China? The immense structure, built as a barricade of protection against invasion, was begun during the 3rd century B.C. by Emperor Shi Huang Ti, Chen, C. 259-210 BC, of the Chen dynasty, and was expanded over the course of succeeding centuries. The wall stretches 1,500 miles, ranges in height between 20 to 50 feet, and is between 15 and 25 feet thick. In the 13th century, the wall was penetrated when Mongols conquered China, expanding their empire across all of Asia.